Good morning. How are you, everybody? It is Friday morning as I record this. Um, I'm still finding my groove with these videos, so bear with me. How is everybody doing? Uh, I've got some things on my mind today that I need to talk about. Um, and some of them might be relevant to you, some might not be. If they are relevant to you and you want to chime in with some comments, I would love to hear from you. Um, I'm just going to dive in. I'm terrible at small talk. And I'm terrible at small talk in real life, too. This is not just because I'm nervous about being on video. I hate small talk. I don't really know how to do it. I never really have. It's terrible. Um, I'm like, get to the point or leave me alone. And that's a bad way to be. I need to perfect my small talk skills. But anyway, so a couple things. How are you doing with your mental health during everything that is going on with the pandemic? Um, one thing I have noticed with myself and with other people is a lot of people are really, really struggling. And there are a lot of reasons for that. We touched on them a little bit in my last video. Uh, one of the reasons being, I think people really miss human connection. And I think we didn't realize how much we relied on human connection until it, you know, face-to-face -face connection was less of an option for a lot of us. Um, you know, between lockdowns, most of which have been lifted, and the need to be careful socializing now, even with fewer restrictions, I think people are realizing that we need that human connection. Maybe that's something that we weren't quite as aware of before, and now we know we need it, and it's really difficult to, to safely have at this point, and that's got a lot of people down. A lot of people don't know what to do with that. More than that, though, um, I think that, at least for me, and I suspect a lot of you, Part of the struggle is the uncertainty of it all. You know, prior to this, most of us had not experienced things that caused a great deal of stress from uncertainty. Um, I do this every time. I always forget my concealer first. I get to talking, blah, 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 and then I start doing my makeup and I realize, oh no, oh no, like in Big Hero 6. Oh no, I forgot to do my concealer. No, I'll just do this part and go back. But anyway, moving on. Um, the uncertainty that we're feeling with everything is difficult. You know, prior to the pandemic and to a lot of other things that are going on right now, I think most of us had a pretty good idea of what our day-to-day -day would look like. And then all of a sudden, we don't have that comfort anymore. Things are changing every day. Um, even when we try to get back to a structured way of living, this pandemic, you know, this virus is so, it's so tenacious and so sneaky, we're finding out that you know, even with our best efforts, there's only so much we can do. And I think for a lot of us, that is hard. Uh, we don't deal well with uncertainty. And it's taking a toll on people, understandably. And a lot of people I know of are struggling right now with loneliness, with a lack of inspiration, with feeling like they just can't do this anymore because this pandemic just goes on and on and on and they don't know how much longer they can, you know, stay inside where it's safest and, and stay, you know, keep their distance from other people who are outside of their household. Um, and I'm not saying that none of those things are hard. Now, I am an introvert. Despite what you might think, I am an introvert. I do very well by myself. I don't mind at all being home for days at a time. 
and I never have. I've been like that my whole life. Um, it's just never bothered me to not have a lot of things that I have to get done that, you know, demand my attention outside of the house. I'm totally okay with that. There are a lot of people who are not though, and they're really having a hard time with being told that, you know, your best bet is to just stay home. And if you have to go out, you need to keep your distance from people. You need to mask up, touch as few surfaces as possible, and so on and so forth. So a lot of people are feeling lonely. They're lacking inspiration. Um, and I've also noticed a lot of people are struggling with their brains just being so mean to them. Now, I have struggled with depression and all the lies depression tells my whole life. I mean, as far back as I can remember, that has been an issue for me. And I've noticed that it is even more so when there's stress. And so for the last several months, we've had stress. Um, we don't know what's happening with, you know, we didn't know what was gonna happen with school. We didn't know what was gonna happen with people's jobs. I mean, a lot of us are just really stressed out for different reasons. And I also want to point out something. Now, I'm, I am disabled. I have been unable to work outside of my home for a little over a year now. Um, and, you know, just before I stopped working altogether, I was only working on a very part-time basis because that was what my body could handle. So, um, you know, I, I am disabled and I get disability every month. Now, some people would look at that and think, oh, well, then you probably don't have much stress at all because you have a guaranteed income. I do. That is true. And I believe me, I recognize my privilege there because there are a lot of people who are out of work who don't know when or if they're going to be able to go back to their jobs. And unemployment isn't paying enough for them to support themselves and people are in trouble people are hurting and i know how lucky we are that i have a guaranteed income every month i am not oblivious to that at all having said that i do want people to be cautious about assuming that just because somebody has an income means they don't have any stress because that just simply isn't true um like any parent I have had stress the last several months having my, you know, having my son home all the time. He's stressed out because he's home all the time. Um, I cannot get this right today. Oh my gosh. I usually do my blush first because my cheeks are so red anyway that it's hard to get it to look right. So I do my blush first and then put the foundation on top of it. I really am not accustomed to talking and doing my makeup at the same time, but I'll get there. I will get there. But back to what I was saying, you know, people who have a guaranteed income, that is just one, one aspect of their life that might be less stressful than someone else's. It doesn't mean they don't have stress. Um, I'm a single parent. I've been a single parent from the beginning. Uh, I've never known what it's like to have a partner helping me raise my child. I have never had that at all. And that gets very stressful. Um, you know, most, most people I know who are not with the other parent have, you know, they, they have alternating weekends. They have, you know, they, they have days that they can count on where they know the child will be with the other parent and hopefully it's a good situation the child is going into. And they can look forward to that. They know that they get a break. They know that they can just regroup. And when their child comes home, they're ready for them. I don't know what that's like. I've never known that. So, um, as, you know, I would be lying to say that in itself has not been stressful. So don't assume that just because someone has an income because they are disabled or whatever the case might be, that means they don't have stress. Because I can tell you, most people are stressed out right now for one reason or another. All right, we're gonna try this. Hopefully it works. 
So my question to you is, what are you doing throughout this pandemic to take care of your mental health? Because people are really struggling and I am getting concerned more than I already was about, um, you know, the level of depression people seem to be experiencing, the level of anxiety people seem to be experiencing. It's high and it's for all different reasons. So what are you doing to take care of your mental health? That is, that's the question I'd love for you to answer for me because when we can talk about these things openly, um, people feel less alone. They realize that they aren't the only ones struggling and it takes away some of the shame that people feel in saying, I'm not doing well and I need some help. Um, there is still, unfortunately, a lot of stigma attached to someone saying, I need help. You know, in, in, especially in America, people still put a lot of pride in that whole bootstraps mentality. And the reality of it is we all need help sometimes, maybe for different things. Maybe the things I need help with, you do just fine with. Maybe some things that I do just fine with, you struggle with. We all need help sometimes. And the idea that our mental health is, is so taboo to discuss that if we need help, well, we must be doing something wrong. We need to get, get rid of that idea right now, especially because we're living through a time when most people are struggling. It's not just a handful of people. I, most people that I know, if they're being honest, are not doing all that well right now because everything is so uncertain. And if we can be honest and say, all this is getting to me, I'm not doing well, then you know, we can tap into supports that we might not, that we wouldn't have if we just kept it all to ourselves. Um, what I'm doing for my mental health, well, part of it is these videos. Um, I have a, f a few people in my life that I can talk to pretty candidly about what I'm going through if I'm struggling. And they can tell me when my brain is just being mean to me and I'm believing things that are not true about myself, about my relationships and so forth. And I've got people in my life who are content to just be present and listen. And sometimes that's all people need. They don't need to be told, oh, you're believing things about yourself that aren't true. Sometimes people just need someone to listen. Because a lot of times, at least for myself, I notice when I actually put into words what I'm believing about myself during a really hard time, um, I can see very easily that the things I'm saying are not true. You know, one of the things that I struggle with tremendously at my... So let me give you a little bit of background. So I'm 45 years old, probably one of the older makeup people on, on YouTube. Um, I'm 45 years old. I am renting a place from my parents. We had to, my son and I moved here when he was a baby because we weren't receiving any child support. So we rented an apartment from my parents and then the housing market crashed. When we first moved into this apartment, I thought, well, it'll be easy to move out. You know, we will just save up some money and we'll get out. Well, there are a few things that happened. And the, you know, the end result though is we've been here for a long time because the housing market crashed. There is almost no affordable housing in this area. Um, even moving out of the area, which I have looked into, is very expensive just to get moved. You know, it drives me, this is a side note, but it drives me crazy when people are like, well, why don't you just move? Oh, gee, I don't know. If only I had thought of that. No, the reality of it is it's expensive to move. You know, most of the time when you move, you have to come up with first and last month's rent and a security deposit, or at least first month's rent and a security deposit. That's a lot of money for people, especially when the housing market here is so abysmal for houses that are actually 
or for rental situations because I don't want to move into a house. I know people always say, oh, you should just buy it. Well, I don't want to. I don't want all that responsibility. I'm one person. I don't want to take that on. But anyway, you know, people say things, they say it so flippantly. Why don't you just move? Well, if you knew, if you've shopped around for housing lately and you have some idea of what it costs, you, perfect, you understand perfectly well why we don't just move. I mean, come on. But anyway, so we're here renting this apartment. Um, you know, I, I don't work outside the home. And I hate it when people say, you know, when, when stay-at-home parents, or when someone says about stay-at-home parents that they don't work. Oh, they work plenty. They just don't work outside of their home. So if we could do away with saying stay-at-home parents don't work, that would be awesome. Uh, anyway, um, you know, my health, the health I've had since I had cancer back in 2007, um, it's really set me back a lot. I never recovered well from all of my treatments. And I've heard this from a lot of people who've had especially radiation therapy, because I didn't do any heavy duty chemo. Uh, side note, no, I do not have cancer right now. I just prefer to shave my head. It's absolutely a choice. Um, and I say that because people do ask, but you know, I, I didn't have any heavy duty chemo, but I did have radiation therapy. And I remember during radiation therapy, I constantly felt like my bones were just radiating pain all the time. Um, I was very sick. Now, some of that was because I had also fallen into addiction to the, the pain medications they gave me. And it took me a long time to come off of those. I've got a lot of red today. Um, so part of how I was feeling was related to, to abusing the pain medication. But most of it had to do with the fact that I just did not handle radiation therapy very well. I was constantly sick. I couldn't keep food down. My body hurt all the time, all over, not just where the radiation was hitting me. It hurt everywhere. And I just never fully recovered from that. So consequently, I, I, you know, I'm not working outside the home. I don't have this, you know, this stellar career that people think all 40-somethings have or should have. And, and I hate should. I wish that we could all just stop shooting on each other because everyone's journey is different. You know, everyone is at a different place. And it doesn't help anyone to tell people what they should be doing at any stage in their life. I mean, everyone is, you know, they're at a different place. We all are at different places and we all do things in our own time. Um, but at the same time, you know, even as I say this, I still often feel as if I should be at a different place in my life, at a more prosperous place in my life. So I constantly struggle with feelings of failure I constantly struggle with feeling like I should be doing more. I should be doing better. Um, you know, I should have a lot more to show for my 45 years on the planet. And because I don't, you know, I don't have a lot of tangible things to show to, you know, if we're being honest about it, what we're saying is we're trying to justify our existence. We're trying to justify taking up space. And because I don't have a lot to show for my 45 years on this planet, um, I constantly feel as if I failed. And it's very easy for me to feel depressed about that. You know, I don't, when I'm feeling that way, I never factor in the circumstances, either in the past or now. Um, and it's, it's very easy for me to overlook those circumstances that got me to this place and just take on the entire burden of how I ended up here. When really, there were things, yes, I made some terrible choices along the way, and I won't deny that. I've talked extensively about my terrible choices. If you've ever read my book, um, I have no problem 
admitting that some of my choices were 100% awful. So it's not that I don't take responsibility for what I did do to contribute to this, but at the same time, there were a lot of experience that I had and am having that are beyond my control. I don't control the housing market. I don't control the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic. I have no control over, well, I have some control over my health, but not to the degree that, you know, I can just snap my fingers and all of a sudden I have no health issues anymore and I forgot to do concealer on the, ins on the inner eye. Um, you know, so there are a lot of factors that come into play For where I am and I also don't factor in all the things that I had to do just to survive up to this point and I would imagine that anybody who struggles with their brain being unkind to them you also probably don't factor in all the things you had to do just to make it this far for example up until 2006 ish 2007 I was fairly okay now I'm gonna qualify that though I grew up in a very religious household and I have struggled with depression most of my life as I said and it went untreated for a very very long time I did not start getting treatment for it till I was in my 20s and that was because I sought it out myself prior to that the solution to depression was, according to my spiritual mentors, I guess, the solution was to read your Bible and pray. And if you were depressed, it was... Now, I was hospitalized for depression back when I was like 24 years old. I was so severely depressed, I was hospitalized. Um, at that point, the person who was my youth pastor at the time, well, they wouldn't be my youth pastor now because I'm 45 years old, as I might have mentioned, but they actually came to visit me at the hospital. And even though I wasn't currently part of their youth group, obviously, they were somebody that I, you know, spent a lot of time with when I was of that age. And they asked me, point blank, what sin is in your life that you're not dealing with that is inviting this to happen to you you know basically saying well yeah you're you're suicidally depressed and you're in the hospital and that's terrible and stuff but how is this your fault what did you do to make this happen so you know prior to when I was able to seek treatment for myself um, I didn't have a lot of people giving me sound support to deal with my mental health. So consequently, because I had these untreated problems, I made a lot of poor choices. A lot of the difficult, you know, difficult, the, a lot of the bad choices that I made in my teen years and in my 20s were directly re related to the fact that I had an untreated mental illness. And that's just the facts. I mean, had I been getting treatment and had I been mentally stable, I don't think I would have made a lot of the choices that I made because I would have been able to think more clearly. I would have been able to use better reasoning, but that was not my, that was not the case with me. Um, I had untreated mental health issues. I was getting no real help of any kind until I got so depressed. I wanted to die. And then, I finally got the help that I needed that I should have had years before. So a lot of the choices that I made were made from a place of, you know, not having a, a, a solid grasp on what was happening. <laughs> I don't know how else to phrase it. I mean, I just wasn't as aware as I should have been of the consequences of the choices I was making. Um, I wasn't as aware as I should have been about, you know, basically what I was doing for my life. I mean, I really, truly was not aware. I, I don't know what else, how else to say it. So that was what happened in my teens and twenties. 
And then when I was in my 30s, you know, at the age of 31 years old, I was diagnosed with cancer. I had my left kidney taken out. And at the same time, they did a certain, you know, some surgical procedures on my abdomen um, because I had an abdominal hernia. So it's a pretty major surgery and I got painkillers for it which one would do when you have an incision that is so large you end up with 40 staples in your belly. I mean, you're going to need something. Um, consequently, you know, I was given the painkillers. And at the time, this was before people were aware of the um, addictive nature of these, of these drugs. I mean, there was some awareness of it, but not like there is now. And I became fully hooked on them. Um, and I could get any, you know, I could get them because being a cancer patient, if I said I was in pain, I could get medication. It was very easy. Um, and I never, you know, I never did any doctor shopping or anything like that. The, the people that I was seeing on a regular basis would just prescribe. If I said I was in pain, they would prescribe. It was very, you know, I, I don't like saying it this way, but you know, at the time it was just very easy. There wasn't much to it. I knew if I said I was in pain, I would get meds and that's just all there was to it. So the fact that I am even, oh, okay. So before I get into that, so here I was, um, going through cancer treatment and going, you know, going through radiation therapy, addicted to painkillers. I, in one of the, the, the reason I liked the painkillers was because I realized, hey, I can take these and then I just go to sleep. I go and I can forget everything, you know, because I had worked very hard to try, you know, build a life for myself away from my parents, away from their religious views and so forth. And when I was diagnosed with cancer and it became apparent that maintaining that life I'd built was not going to be possible because I wasn't going to be able to work for a long time. Um, my short-term disability was not going to be enough to carry me for as long as I was going to be unable to work. I got very, very depressed. So being able to sleep for hours at a time after taking a pain medication was awesome. I, I could just go to sleep and just kind of forget everything. And who wouldn't want that if you're depressed? I mean, you know, it's like jackpot. And I remember I was so deeply depressed that when I would wake up in the morning, I would be upset. I would be mad because I woke up. I would be so angry that the painkillers, because I was, there got to be a point where the painkillers were not putting me to sleep anymore. And so I would take them with alcohol and just wait for um, sleep to come and it came pretty quickly not passing out but just taking enough that I could get into bed and fall asleep um, as anybody who drinks would tell you though that kind of sleep is is not very restful and a lot of times you end up waking up a few hours later so I was going through this cycle of using drugs and alcohol to get to sleep and then being angry when they didn't keep me asleep all night and then being more upset when I would actually wake up in the morning because if I was being honest with myself, the hope that I had was that I would, uh, I would die. I mean, it's just that simple. I had this hope that I would die and I would get mad when that is not what happened. <laughs> Which I say it now, and I'm like, wow, that's a really dark place to be in. And I'm not laughing about it because it's funny. It's just like like such an extreme thought process to have. It's kind of unfathomable to me now. I couldn't imagine doing that now. But back then, that was a fervent hope that I had. Like, maybe I'll accidentally take it off so that I can die. And then I would get mad when that's not what happened. And it's a very strange thought process, but if you've ever been there, you know. It's not that you actually, you know, most of the time it's not because people actually want to die. It's just because they're tired of being in pain. Physical pain, 
psychic pain, people get tired of hurting all the time. And so they have these extreme thought processes where they're like, if I do A, B, and C, it might result in death and wouldn't that be terrible? But yet at the same time, all the while thinking, you know, no, that would not be terrible. That's actually something I could be on board with. And it's a very sad place to be. And it's a very dark place and lonely place to be. And especially because at that time in my life, I didn't have people that I felt like I could be honest with about how deeply I was struggling. And that went on for a long, long time. So the fact that I'm here today putting on my makeup and talking to you about this is pretty amazing. And that's not something I give myself nearly enough credit for. I mean, the amount of strength it takes for a person who is struggling that badly to continue on and, you know, to choose to stay, it's amazing because it takes a lot to be in a place that is so dark and still choose to believe that it's worth it to stick around. It's very difficult. And so when I start feeling like I'm a complete and utter failure who's never done anything worthwhile, I have to think about the fact that, you know, the fact that I'm here at all is pretty phenomenal because it, for a long time that was not a guaranteed thing. I mean, I was doing dangerous, dangerous things. I was making bad decisions. I was doing things to my body that I just couldn't even think about right now. I mean, I couldn't even, there's just no way I could do those things now. But at the time, yeah, of course. I mean, it made perfect sense to me to just see how far I could push things and Hope I didn't push it too far, but at the same time, not caring too much if I did, if that makes sense. So when your brain is being mean to you, which is happening a lot because we're all so isolated from each other, a lot of the things that we used to make ourselves feel better, like meeting up with friends, um, going out to our favorite coffee place, um, you know, maybe, you know, whatever, whatever it was. A lot of those things aren't available to us right now. And whether you think that's right or wrong, the fact is that's how it is. And, and how you feel about it as far as whether it should be that way or not isn't relevant because it is that way. And it's not going to change just because we feel, you know, some people feel anyway, that it's not right. You know, our feelings about it are not and there are of no consequence. So if your brain is lying to you and telling you that your life isn't worth living right now because, you know, you feel as if you've failed, you feel as if you're not good enough, first of all, recognize just about everybody is struggling right now. It's not just you. Secondly, recognize that your feelings are valid. And probably a lot of what we're feeling right now, whether we've recognized it or not, is grief. Even if you haven't lost someone in this pandemic by way of death, a lot of us have lost things that we love simply because they are things we can't do right now. And I think it, it's, it would be really selling ourselves short if we were to tell ourselves this isn't worth grieving over because it is, you know, a lot of the things that we look to, to make our days feel less lonely, less, um, monotonous, you know, less, uh, cut off from everything. A lot of those things that we look to for that aren't accessible. And there is grief involved in acknowledging that. There's a lot of grief involved in acknowledging that. And I think that when we say we can't grieve because it wasn't the death of a person, I think that we're um, not doing ourselves any favors by, by saying that grief doesn't matter because it does. So if we allow ourselves to feel those feelings and say, you know what, it, it hurts that I can't go do those things. I miss my friends. I miss my 
routines. I miss the things that brought me comfort. And it's okay to say that. There is no harm. You know, there's nothing to be ashamed of there in saying, you know what, I miss the things that made my life colorful and fun. It's okay to acknowledge that. And I think that if we would allow, I think we're at a place where if people acknowledge that, that it, it, it comes, you know, people are interpreting it as, I don't take this pandemic seriously and I want to harm other people by saying, you know, forget wearing a mask and forget social distancing. I'm going to do what I want to do. Now, granted, some people are doing that and that's terrible in my opinion. It's selfish and it's entitled, but there's nothing wrong with saying, even though I know this is the best thing right now, it's still painful and I miss all the things that I had before this pandemic hit us. And I think that allowing ourselves to grieve that would be helpful. And if you can find safe people in your life to, to grieve those things with, then I think, now I can't say for sure because this isn't my specialty, but I'm just, I think that we would find our mental health would improve if we could just be honest about the fact that we, yes, we grieve these things. We don't just miss them, we grieve them. We are sad that they're gone. And sad that, you know, the normal that we once knew is not going to be back for a long time, if ever. You know, life may never return to what it was just prior to the pandemic. You know, who could have thought at the beginning of this year that these things were going to happen and everything we knew was going to change. Nobody, nobody suspected that at all. We all came into 2020 thinking, you know, if we had, if two, 2019 wasn't good for a, good to us, then 2020 was going to be our year. This is the year that all the things that we wanted and worked toward were going to happen. And then this pandemic came out of nowhere, as far as we knew anyway. And everything changed. Suddenly all the things that we were looking forward to just were not available to us. So I think that it's right to grieve that. So start, if you can, by just saying, you know what? I grieve these things. These are losses to me and I'm grieving them. And that's okay. And then I also want you to keep in mind that, you know, you're here. The fact that you are here, especially if you're someone who has struggled with you know, chronic depression, you know, if you have a major depressive disorder or something along those lines, if you have, if you've been dealing with that for a very long time, trust me, I know how tempting it is at one point or another to just say, none of this is worth it. And I, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, I get that. I do. And there's no shame in that. But I do hope that you'll stick around. Um, when I, so one of the bad decisions that I made as I was going through my cancer treatments and then ultimately, you know, they ended and I was trying to make my life as close to what I considered normal as possible. One of the unfortunate decisions I made was I married someone I hardly knew. Now, you have to understand, I came from an evangelical background, and in evangelical circles, what is normalized is marriage and family. That's like a goal people set for themselves. And if you can't, if you don't have that, so by the time I was finished with all my treatments and stuff, I was almost 32 years old. And if you don't have those things, by that age, you're considered something of a failure. And there's that word again, failure. So I married somebody I hardly knew because I wanted to have some sense of normalcy in my life. That was one of the biggest mistakes I ever made. And so in addition to struggling with depression anyway, um, I was also struggling now with being in a marriage that was literally terrifying every single day. And I remember very clearly back when I still prayed, telling God that I am ready to be done. I either want to 
you either have to make things better, you know, give me something to live for, or I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. And shortly after that, I found out I was pregnant. And that gave me the strength to leave my marriage, file for divorce. You know, I, I, I've been a single mom the entire time. I went through my pregnancy without a partner. Um, I think I saw, I saw my husband one more time after I left, and that was it. And then my divorce was finalized when my son was three months old. And in this entire time, I was by myself. You know, so I get feeling like everything is so bleak, you can't go on. But I hope that you will. And I hope that you will know that, yes, things can be bleak. But then after they're done being bleak for a little bit, they get better. And then maybe they get crappy again. And then they get better. And that's kind of how life is. Things are hard for a while, and then they get better. And then things get crappy again for a while, and then they get better. And that's kind of how it all works. And, you know, there are so many things I would have missed out on if I had followed through on that feeling that I don't want to be here anymore. And I'm really glad that I stayed. And I hope that every day you're here, you're glad you stayed too. Because I can guarantee you there are people in your life who are glad you're choosing to stay. And I hope that until you can feel it for yourself, that those feelings from other people will be enough to carry you for a little bit. Because sometimes that's what we need. We need to be carried for a while. And then we find our own strength and we can be on our, you know, we can, we can carry ourselves. And maybe someone else needs to be carried for a while and we can carry them. And we all take turns because none of us are doing 100% great 100% of the time. None of us. And there's no shame in saying, I need help. And there's no shame in being the one carrying other people and giving them that help that they need. There's no shame. And I think another one of these surprise blessings of COVID-19 has been, at least from my perspective, that we're learning that we all struggle sometimes. All of us do. And we need each other. All right, I'm going to finish this off camera, and then I'll be back with some final thoughts. All right, I am back. Yes, I am wearing blue lipstick. I just wanted to. It doesn't really go with my whole look, but that's okay. I wanted to see what it would look like, and I'm very happy with it. Um, so my final thoughts are this. If your brain is being mean to you, remember, and this sounds so cliche, but it matters, you have survived 100% of your bad days so far. You are not a failure, you are not alone in your struggles, and you, if you choose to hang on, believe me, there are people who are very glad that you did. Be kind to yourself, um, and when you recognize that your brain is lying to you, if you don't have the energy to combat those lies, you know, constantly knock them down with some truth, at least recognize that what you're feeling will pass it might not be easy, it might take a while, but you're not gonna feel like that forever. It does pass. Reach out to people you can trust. Reach out to people who have always been in your corner and you know that they will love you through these bad days. And know that these difficult days will end at some point. We don't know when, and it's probably going to be an ebb and flow because that's how life works. Very rarely is life consistently great or consistently awful. Um, it kind of is an up and down. That's how it is for everybody. So you're not alone. There are people you can reach out to. If you don't have a good support network, I will leave some numbers in the description uh, for people you can call to just talk you through a rough time. And you'll get through. This was not what I intended to talk about today, but after seeing a few posts on social media about how people are struggling with depression and not feeling any creativity, no, no inspiration and so forth, I felt it was important to talk about this and to share 
some of my own experiences with feeling this way because boy have I had them. Anyway, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, I hope you're enjoying these videos. If there's a topic you would like me to discuss, um, please leave it in the comments and I will do my best. Take care of yourself and I'll talk to you soon.